Good afternoon. I just got done watching Hillary Clinton's speech on the alt-right community. I thought it was hysterical. <laughs> She's such an idiot. To be honest with you, I don't even know this community existed until probably March when I heard some moron on CNN complaining about Alex Jones. So, you know, curiosity got me, Googled him and then subscribed to his uh, YouTube channel. Found it very informative, uh, especially about 9-11. Being a survivor and rescuer of 9-11, I found it very interesting. And uh, the information he gave out did put a, little, a lot of the uh, pieces of the puzzle together that always bothered me about that day and the days afterwards. So, when these tyrannical leftists start complaining, you know their ship is sinking. I mean, she brings up quotes from Milo Yiannopoulos, who's another person I didn't even know exists until people were complaining about him six, seven months ago. And then I started paying attention to what he had to say, and I thought it was, in his words, fabulous. <laughs> I'm a lover of free speech. I'm a lover of the Constitution. And she is obviously, she meaning Hillary Clinton is obviously more than a fascist. Probably sliding on the Stalinist scale. You know, she's just incredibly stupid. I remember her and Bill in the early 90s when I started working in New York City in the 911 community. Well, I guess you could tell by my screen name that I'm a paramedic or was recently retired paramedic from New York City. And I remember the crime and the context of her speaking about the super predators and making them the heel. Let me tell you that speech. I remember when she made that. Uh, I cringed. But even then you knew Democrats could say anything you wanted. You knew that they were the plantation masters. They could say and do anything they wanted in regards to race or religion. You know, God forbid a Republican or somebody who's conservative makes an off-color comment, you're done and over with. But this Stalinist witch can say and do whatever she pleases in the mainstream media, which is bought and paid for, as the DNC leak showed, will cover for her without question. So these are my comments on the speech. I'm probably gonna link the speech or attach it to this video so you can draw your own opinion. But uh, she's an idiot. And bringing up Alex Jones or Milo Yiannopoulos or Breitbart or any of these alternate sources of news is just gonna enhance their viewership and uh, impart knowledge on people who really didn't care about certain issues, whether it be the economy, 9-11, or what did she bring up? She brought up uh, Oklahoma City. You know, curious people are going to look at these things and come to some really strong conclusions when you uh, have documented evidence. She's in a sinking ship. That's all I can say. She's on a sinking ship. Uh, thank you for listening. Everywhere I go, people tell me how concerned they are by the divisive rhetoric coming from my opponent in this election. And I... I understand that concern because it's like nothing we've heard before from a nominee, 
for President of the United States from one of our two major parties. From the start, Donald Trump has built his campaign on prejudice and paranoia. He is taking hate groups mainstream and helping a radical fringe take over the Republican Party. His disregard for the values that make our country great is profoundly dangerous. In just this past week, under the guise of outreach to African Americans, Trump has stood up in front of largely white audiences and described black communities in such insulting and ignorant terms. Poverty, super predators, no conscience, no empathy. We can talk about why they ended up that way, but first we have to bring them to heal. And the poverty, rejection, horrible education, no housing, no homes, no ownership, crime at levels nobody has seen. Right now, he said, you can walk down the street and get shot. Those are his words. But when I hear them, I think to myself, how sad. Donald Trump misses so much. He doesn't see the success of black leaders in every field, the vibrancy of black owned businesses, the strength of the black church. He doesn't see. He doesn't see the excellence of historically black colleges and universities or the pride of black parents watching their children thrive. He apparently didn't see police chief Brown of Dallas on television after the murders of five of his officers conducting himself with such dignity. He certainly doesn't have any solutions to take on the reality of systemic racism and create more equity and opportunity in communities of color and for every American. It really does take a lot of nerve to ask people he's ignored and mistreated for decades, what do you have to lose? Because the answer is everything. <laughs> now, Trump's lack of knowledge or experience or solutions would be bad enough. But what he's doing here is more sinister. Trump is reinforcing harmful stereotypes and offering a dog whistle to his most hateful supporters. It's a disturbing preview of what kind of president he'd be. And that's what I want to make clear today. A man with a long history of racial discrimination who traffics in dark conspiracy theories drawn from the pages of supermarket tabloids and the far dark reaches of the internet should never run our government or command our military. Ask yourself, if he doesn't respect all Americans, how can he serve all Americans? Now, I, I know that some people still want to give Trump the benefit of the doubt. They hope that he will eventually reinvent himself, that there's a kinder, gentler, more responsible Donald Trump waiting in the wings somewhere. Because after all, it is hard to believe anyone, let alone a nominee for president, could really believe all the things he says. But here's the hard truth. There is no other Donald Trump. This is it. And Maya Angelou, a great American whom I admired very much, she once said, when someone shows you who they are, Believe them the first time. <laughs> well, throughout his career and this campaign, Donald Trump has shown us exactly who, it, who he is, and I think we should believe him. When he was getting his start in business, he was sued by the Justice Department for refusing to rent apartments to black and Latino tenants. Their applications would be marked with a C, C for colored, and then rejected. 
Three years later, the Justice Department took Trump back to court because he hadn't changed. And the pattern continued through the decades. State regulators fined one of Trump's casinos for repeatedly removing black dealers from the floor. No wonder the turnover rate for his minority employees was way above average. And let's not forget that Trump first gained political prominence leading the charge for the so-called birthers. He promoted the racist lie that President Obama is not really an American citizen, part of a sustained effort to delegitimize America's first black president. And in 2015, Trump launched his own campaign for president with another racist lie. He described Mexican immigrants as rapists and criminals, and he accused the Mexican government of actively sending them across the border. None of that is true. And oh, by the way, by the way, Mexico's not paying for his wall either. If, if he ever tries to get it built, the American taxpayer will pay for it. We'll be stuck with the bill, but there has been a steady stream of bigotry coming from him. I think we all remember when Trump said a distinguished federal judge born in Indiana could not be trusted to do his job because, quote, he's a Mexican. Think about that. The man who today is the standard bearer of the Republican Party said a federal judge who, by the way, had a distinguished record as a U.S. attorney, had to go in hiding because Mexican drug gangs were after him, who has Mexican heritage, but just like me, was born in this country, is somehow incapable solely because of his heritage. Even the Republican Speaker of the House of Representatives, Paul Ryan, described that, and I quote, as the textbook definition of a racist comment. And to this day, to this day, Trump has never apologized to Judge Curiel. But for Trump, that is just par for the course. This is someone who retweets white supremacists online, like the user who goes by the name White Genocide TM. Trump took this fringe bigot with a few dozen followers and spread his message to 11 million people. His campaign famously posted an anti-Semitic image, a Star of David, imposed over a sea of dollar bills that first appeared on white supremacist websites. The Trump campaign has also selected a prominent white national, nationalist leader as a delegate in California, and they only dropped him under pressure. When asked in a nationally televised interview whether he would disavow the support of David Duke, a former grand wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, Trump wouldn't do it. And only later again, under mounting pressure, did he backtrack. And when Trump was asked about anti-Semitic slurs and death threats coming from his supporters, he refused to condemn them. Through it all, he has continued pushing discredited conspiracy theories with racist undertones. You remember he said that thousands of American Muslims in New Jersey cheered the 9-11 attacks. They didn't. He suggested that Senator Ted Cruz's father was involved in the Kennedy assassination. Now, perhaps in Trump's mind, because Mr. Cruz was a Cuban immigrant, he must have had something to do with it. And there is absolutely, of course, no evidence of that. Just recently, Trump claimed that President Obama founded ISIS. And he has repeated that over and over again. His latest paranoid fever dream is about my health. <laughs> and all I can say is, Donald, dream on. But, but my
my friends. <laughs> but my friends, this is what happens when you treat the National Enquirer like gospel. They said in October I'd be dead in six months. It's also what happens when you listen to the radio host, Alex Jones, who claims that 9-11 and the Oklahoma City bombings were inside jobs. He even said, and this really just is so disgusting, he even said the victims of the Sandy Hook massacre were child actors and no one was actually killed there. I don't know what happens in somebody's mind or how dark their heart must be to say things like that. But Trump doesn't challenge these lies. He actually went on Jones's show and said, your reputation is amazing. I will not let you down. This from the man who wants to be president of the United States. You know, I've stood by President Obama's side as he made the toughest decisions a commander-in-chief has to make. In times of crisis, our country depends on steady leadership, clear thinking, calm judgment, because one wrong move can mean the difference between life and death. I know we have veterans here, and I know we have families, mothers and spouses and children of people currently serving. The last thing we need in the Situation Room is a loose cannon who can't tell the difference, or doesn't care to, between fact and fiction, and who buys so easily into racially tinged rumors. Someone so detached from reality should never be in charge of making decisions that are as real as they come. And that is yet another reason why Donald Trump is simply temperamentally unfit to be president of the United States. Now, I, I hear and I read some people who are saying, well, that his bluster and his bigotry is, is just overheated campaign rhetoric. An outrageous person saying outrageous things for attention. But look at his policies. The ones that Trump has proposed, they would put prejudice into practice. And don't be distracted by his latest efforts to muddy the waters. He may have some new people putting new words in his mouth, but we know where he stands. He would form a deportation force to round up millions of immigrants and kick them out of the country. He'd abolish the bedrock constitutional principle that says if you're born in the United States, you're an American citizen. He says that children born to undocumented parents in America are anchor babies and should be deported, millions of them. He'd banned Muslims around the world from entering our country just because of their religion. Now think about that for a minute. How would that actually work? So people landing in US airports would line up to get their passports stamped, just like they do now. But in Trump's America, when they step up to the counter, the immigration officer would ask every single person, what is your religion? And then what? What if someone says, I'm a Christian, but the agent doesn't believe him? Do they have to prove it? How would they do that? Really, ever since the pilgrims landed on Plymouth Rock, America has distinguished itself as a haven for people fleeing religious persecution, believing in religious freedom and religious liberty. <laughs> Under Donald Trump, America would distinguish itself as the only country in the world to impose a religious test at the border. Now, come to think of it, there actually may be one other place that does that, the so-called Islamic State, the territory that ISIS controls. What a cruel irony that someone running for president would equate us with them. Now, but don't worry, some will say, 
As President, Trump will be surrounded by smart advisors who will rein in his worst impulses. So when a tweet gets under his skin and he wants to retaliate with a cruise missile, maybe cooler heads will convince him not to. Well, maybe. But look at who he's put in charge of his campaign. Trump likes to say he only hires the best people. But he's had to fire so many campaign managers, it's like an episode from The Apprentice. <laughs> And the latest shakeup was designed to, quote, let Trump be Trump. So to do that, he hired Stephen Bannon, the head of a right-wing website called Breitbart.com, as the campaign CEO. Now, to give you a flavor of his work, here are a few headlines they've published. And I'm not making this up. Birth control makes women unattractive and crazy. Would, your, would you rather your child had feminism or cancer? Oh. Gabby Giffords, the gun control movement's human shield. Oh. Hoisted high and proud, the Confederate flag proclaims a glorious heritage. And that one came shortly after the Charleston massacre, when Democrats and Republicans alike were doing everything they could to heal racial divides that Breitbart and Bannon tried to inflame. Just imagine Donald Trump reading that and thinking, this is what I need more of in my campaign. Now, Bannon has nasty things to say about pretty much everyone. This spring, he railed against Speaker Paul Ryan for, quote, rubbing his social justice Catholicism in my nose every second. No wonder he's gone to work for Trump, the only presidential candidate ever to get into a public feud with the Pope. <laughs> it's truly, it's truly hard to believe, but according to the Southern Poverty Law Center, which tracks hate groups, Breitbart embraces ideas on the extremist fringe of the conservative right. This is not conservatism as we have known it. This is not republicanism as we have known it. These are racist ideas, race-baiting ideas, anti-Muslim, anti-immigrant, anti-women, all key tenets making up the emerging racist ideology known as the alt-right. Now, alt-right is short for alternative right. The Wall Street Journal describes it as a loose but organized movement, mostly online, that rejects mainstream conservatism, promotes nationalism, and views immigration and multiculturalism as threats to white identity. So the de facto merger between Breitbart and the Trump campaign represents a landmark achievement for this group a fringe element that has effectively taken over the Republican Party.